The 1999 Nigerian constitution is a glorified death certificate, says Pastor Tunde Bakare. And active citizenship and youth involvement in Nigeria's development. How ready is the Nigerian youth for leadership? This is Plus Politics. I'm Mary Anko. The serving overseer, the Citadel Global Community Church, Pastor Tunde Bakari, has called for a change of guard in the country, saying those around President Muhammad Buhari look tired. Bakari said this at the State of the Nation broadcast on Sunday, adding that it is time to rescue Nigeria from opportunists in government. He also stated that... Um, the 1999 Constitution, as a he referred to the 1999 Constitution as a glorified death certificate, saying that it should be replaced for the country if it wants to achieve greatness. Well, joining us to discuss this is Gideo Logun, he's a legal practitioner, and Bola Oba, who is a political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Um, I'm sure that you have gone over the statement um, and the press release um, by Pastor Tunde Bakari, who has uh, at some time, or was at, at, at the time, a running mate of Mr. President. Um, but he's also been waxing very lyrical lately. He's been criticizing the president and, of course, the Buhari-led administration as a whole. Now, let's start with the first thing um, that, you know, he mentioned. Again, a lot of people who obviously are on the president's side or people who are supporters of Mr. President will say that this is another jab, just another political jab by someone who wants to try to float a political party or someone who has interest in running for the office of the president. But he has called for handlers of sorts. Uh, he's saying that there has to be a change of guard. And he called Mr. President's handlers tired. Um, and he says it's time to rescue the country from opportunities, uh, from opportunists, I beg your pardon. Who do you think these opportunists are uh, that he was making reference to? I'll start with you, Mr. Oba. Who do you think he was referring to? He's referring to, I would want to presume, because I don't know is that, I'm not omniscient, and I'm not in the same business as he is. I'm not a seer, but I want to believe that he's referring to uh, the political jobbers around the president those who have made the president to be so recalcitrant in acknowledging some of the recommendations of the last political confabulation. Those who have the ears of the president and have made him in the six years of his, of his two-term tenure, uh, in the six years the last far spent, have made him to seem impervious to all the imperatives for change that have uh, uh, thus far uh, been, been designed, acknowledged, and by any sensible person to have been deemed necessary to reform this country in the direction of progress. I guess it must be referring to those, to those people. But I think it's a bit kinder because ordinarily, and one who believes that irrespective of the advice that any principal officer gets, it is incumbent on that principal officer to, principal officer to define the integrity and the stature of the office that God has divinely placed in me, my take. Hmm. Well, he goes ahead to talk about the change of guard, which I mentioned at the beginning, and a need for fresh hands and fresh insights into how to fix, you know, um, the people and the nation in itself. Is that really what the country needs at this point in time? Do we need fresh hands and fresh insights, uh, as opposed to the systemic corruption that we're facing today? The fact that we, the people, seem to also be aiding and abating whatever is happening to us, except you probably uh, do not agree with me. Uh, to some extent, I don't necessarily uh, want to uh, uh, 
agree fully with him, but to some extent, whatever constitution we may write, whatever form of government we may decide to resort to, we have a political class that we have a political class whose members have unfortunately have their DNA negative, neg negatively tweaked. This political class, members of this political class will walk any constitutional ground. Members of this political class have sold their souls to to greed and voracious accumulation. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? We can write the constitution <clears throat> as much as we can write the constitution as much as we, we want, but if these people, the politicals that we have now are those who will work the constitution they will always find a way of bastardizing it. You'll be shocked if one goes into itemizing some of the laws we have in this direction that have been made so functionally, so functionally uh, useless because of the ingenuity of the Nigerian political class at making any form of any form of legislation or any form of rule nonsensical when it comes to, you know, perverting it. Hmm. That's, that's the little I can say about that. Let me come to you, Mr. Logan. Um, just picking up from where uh, Mr. Oba stopped, if, if, if this seems to be, I'm, that's it, I'm assuming if you agree with him, if you think that, um, you know, the re we cannot necessarily change the constitution to change the system because he's saying that these political or politicians are somewhat the problem and they always find a way around it. So how do we change the Nigeria to the Nigeria that we want? How do we go about it? Because when you refer to the political class, you're talking about everybody. You're talking about the executive. You're talking about the legislators. And these are the people who are supposedly tasked with the responsibility of making the laws that would one way or the other supposedly change the Nigeria to the Nigeria that we want. So how do we go about it? I, I must start by commending the very brilliant submissions of Mr. Gola Oba, and I aligned my views with his. You know, it's like when you get a very beautiful business plan that is crafted in Spanish language, and you hand it over to someone who only understands French language, you are going nowhere with that plan, no matter how beautiful it is. And I think that is what where we have found ourselves in Nigeria now. And I will explain that further. It has to do with the mindset of those who have been saddled with implementing the Constitution. I mean, as a matter of personal opinion, the Constitution we have is not so bad. Perhaps what Pastor Tunde Bakari was trying to reflect is the fact that let's change how this country is governed. I've said it, if you take the time, to study section 14 to section 18 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, you find very beautiful provisions in that part of the Constitution. And of course, if those provisions have been implemented up to 60%, it is my view that Nigeria should be the third richest country in the world right now. But we have found ourselves in a situation where those who are given the assignment of managing this country are running contrary to the wonderful provisions of the Constitution. And that is where I agree with uh, Pastor Tine Bakari that there is a need for change of guard, which means that those who are around the president are either tired or confused or they have lost the vision of national development. And if that is the case, why don't you bring in those who we have the mindset of development in line with the sustainable goals of the United Nations that will be benchmarked and evaluated in year 2030. And having said that, I also agree with uh, Mr. Uh, that 
those around the president look up to him. They study his body language. If the president has a vision of developing this country, he's been there now for six years. I believe that he would have done everything to reflect that positive change. I, I mean, I should be disturbed as a leader if when I came to office, my country was indebted to the tune of 3.12 trillion naira, talking about March 2015, and these are on record, please. And today, year 2021, my country is owing about 33, above 33 trillion naira. I should be disturbed that even though my minister of uh, information and culture has repeatedly bombarded the people about investment in massive infrastructure, massive infrastructure. And just this week, a report came out that NNPC is trying to intervene in restructuring some roads in the country that are making it difficult to circulate fuel within the country. So where is the massive infrastructure we have spent so much on? I should be disturbed as a leader that in one week, and this report is on record, over 45 human beings were reportedly killed in one week, one week of seven days. I should be disturbed that soldiers are killed in their numbers. 25 military base taken over, bandits bringing down a fighter jets, different kinds of kidnappings and things around the country, which of course is provided for in section 14, subsection 2 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, mm -hmm. that says that the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. I'm yet to confirm, but I hear that a bag of beans is over 85,000 naira now. And I know that the food inflation is around 22% right now. The unemployment rate in Nigeria is above 37%. So you can go on and on and on. NNPC has threatened zero remittance to the Federation account. So it's like we are, in fact, right now, we are going we are, we, are, we are projecting a 2022 a budget that will be a deficit budget. So all this should make you as a leader to either look inwards and ask yourself a simple question, am I effective? And look around you. If the people you have called to support you are the ones that are not effective, then you do something about it. But in, the case, like but in a case where, the but in a case where we see a president who's patting himself on the back, who's saying that he's, I mean, we, we listened, I'm sure you did listen to that budget presentation uh, in, in front of the Joint National Assembly. It seemed more like a, a pat on the back or a scorecard of sorts. Um, not seeing it, necessarily seeing any wrong in what's happening, acknowledging some and not acknowledging the others. And, and that's not our conversation today. But in the absence of the president, um, in your words, recognizing and looking within, again, 2023 beckoned, we're seeing names thrown into the air. We're seeing conversations around people who may or may not succeed the president. But the teething problems, the, the elephant in the room, is that we are fighting corruption, a corruption that the president and his administration promised to deal with is still the big, biggest elephant in the room. We're still dealing with um, disobedience of you know, court orders and you know, lack of any regards for the rule of law. We're seeing that protesters can no longer protest you know, freely without them being shot at, and that those who are being shot at cannot get justice. We're seeing a long list of these things happening. And I go back to the question that I asked earlier on. If we cannot rely on the people who we gave the mandate to write the kind of laws that would help us, people who are supposed to represent us, what do we do then? Well, the, this question has been answered but not satisfactory. Uh, I think we're having connection problems with you, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Logo. So I'm going to switch back to uh, Bola. I've heard from the government. Okay. Is that you wait for the year? Go ahead. Okay. That, you know, we, we've constantly been told by the government that we have to wait for the election years if we are not satisfied with the performance, and that is very dangerous. So that means if you are driving me in the wrong direction and we have to pass through bus stops, I must wait until we get to the destination 
whether successfully or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And like you have expressed also, it has become very dangerous under a democracy to protest. We call it emotional ventilation in HR. So people are not even allowed to express their pains. You see the expression of inequity in the land, injustice in the land. Bandits are being pampered and some agitators are being hammered. You see, I think you, it, it's quite obvious. But in answering your question, what we are told is that we have to wait till 2023. But what happens if by 2023 or before 2023, this country is owing 50 trillion naira? Where is the future we are talking about? What happens if, like it was reported in one of the states in the north, I think in Niger State, that the bandits have taken over about 18 wards in Niger State? Then where do we turn? What happens if the threat that came up when we heard this Boko Haram people, Islamic states of West Africa, who said they applied in Niger State. I know how close Niger State is to Asobila. We have quickly retorted that what happened in Afghanistan cannot happen in Nigeria. But I have done a personal study and research and discovered that what Mohammed Yusuf started in Nigeria in around 2000 and 2002 is, is, is in line with the template of uh, Mohammed Omar, who started that of the Taliban in okay. Afghanistan. So where do we go? Look at the economy. Look at everything. So where do we go from there? Are we now going to say that after Titanic sank, what next? Hmm. You see, and that is why we are calling on, on well-meaning Nigerians now to rise up. You see, uh, Henry Ford, who lived between 1863 and 1947, said, coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. Working together is success. Can we okay. claim to be working together in Nigeria now? Look well, at the southern governors and the northern governors. We seem not to agree about everything. We are back to what happened in 1953, May 1953, when we were going to have our independence from the colonial masters, the killings in Kano, because we did not agree on that venture. And today we are here to synchronize and be a united nation to focus on development. So where do okay. we go? Okay, great question. But let me go to Bola Oba. Uh, Mr. Oba, I keep hearing that, and, and, and this is a recurring statement in um, Pastor Bakare's message to Nigerians uh, in his State of the Nation message. I keep hearing that we need competent Nigerians, Nigerians who are able to lift us out of the corruption, the endemic corruption that we're facing, um, that, that, that would give us a change of scenery. So the question that keeps coming to mind every time I hear anybody say this, whether it be a politician or not, is are we really in short supply of people who are capable of doing right or, or leading us as the constitution dictates and fighting corruption? Or is it that the system just keeps throwing up the same sorts of people and the door is shut on the faces uh, of the people who are really um, there to serve? One of the, the foibles, one of the failures of liberal democracy, especially liberal democracies that are powered with money, big money, one of the fa uh, failures they define, be it in rest of America, be it in our kingdom, be it even in some reasonable places where you still have a relative degree of uh, a modicum of relative decency in how they dramatize the liberal democracies, say like Germany, or one of the major foibles especially in liberal democracies where money becomes a major agent of actualizing political aspirations is what, is what you get in Nigeria. People who have the money, not necessarily because they are value creators, not necessarily because they are competent, not necessarily because they can they can turn situations around, mm -hmm. 
But because they have a pool of money to leverage, to abuse the systemic dignities of the democratic system, even the gentleman who told us, even the person who told us that he could not buy his phone, he was adopted by a political echo, a political configuration, which was an amalgam of some legacy parties with deep pocketed characters. And when they adopted him, they ultimately not only paid for his form, but also supposedly financed his campaigns. We are where we are with that too. So I'm sitting there thinking that your question is a question that can be best answered if one observes the integrity of democracies, liberal democracies across the world, from America, that ultimately threw up a character like Trump, to the United Kingdom, where a comical character, you know, Boris Johnson, is literally driving an historically successful nation almost into the abyss as we speak. You can imagine when there is when there is riot or when they are when when they are accused in in petrol for courts in England. So I'm sitting where I'm sitting now thinking, you know what? We have chosen a system that in itself in the age of information in, 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 in information suffocation is literally being dragged to a form of systemic nonsensicalness. So are you saying that we so, put, so are you saying, are you accepting that we play a role in this? We're part of the problem. We because you see, you see whether it's a Boris Johnson or Donald Trump, or I mean, that that's a totally different case. But of course, uh, but in Nigeria, we seem to be going around in the same circles, and we still point fingers at the politicians. But what is our role in creating the monster of money politics that you have rightly described? I, I am not one. I am not one who blames. A, a, a lady that has been raped for putting for wearing a particular dress or for for making herself to be to be susceptible to the violence of the rapist. When I hear people wanting to blame the Nigerian electorate, I shake my head. People who have been systemically uh, cast into poverty. People who literally, literally have to combat with subsistence on a daily basis. Okay. Even eating. And somebody would have the temerity wanting to do analysis, blaming the victim for the conduct of for, for the conduct of his or her abusers. I don't know how well I, I cannot do political analysis like that. Yeah. Look. This is a country where, and I'm talking as somebody who does it on a daily basis. If you incentivize an African Nigerian, you will be shocked the level of brilliance, okay. the level of creativity, the level of productivity that you will see on the table. But when all the systemic incentives that we've seen in other politics, and other societies have been withdrawn on the table. And these people have been reduced to the basic animalistic state of existence. Somebody is telling me that we should blame them. Okay. All right. Finally, Mr. Logo, I'm going to um, let you be the, you know, put the cap on this one. Um, so we're talking about all the problems. Let's talk about solutions, the way forward. Pastor Bakari has said that um, we have a single assignment, and it is to send them packing, them in this regard, are uh, the politicians who are 
in the words of Bolaba, driving us into the abyss. I'm borrowing, borrowing that phrase. Um, so what is the way forward? How do, we, how do we get out of this mess? Because now he's saying we can't victim blame. We need to, you know, call a spade a spade. The politicians are our problem. But we the people, how ready are we for 2023? Because, you know, there has to be some form of engagement. The average Nigerian is hungry. He's telling you that the cost of living is rising high. His spending power has not increased. He's still having the same salary and still has to buy his gas cylinder for about 6000 or 7500 Why should he bother about any politician? So what do we do? You know... What I have seen here is a desecration of trust. The electorates have chosen to vote some people into office, and if they turn around to punish the people who brought them into office, if these human beings are powerless against them, God be right against them. Look at what happened in Rwanda. Eventually, God made way for a Paul Kagame that has translated the narratives in, uh, in, in Rwanda. Rwanda is one of the fastest growing economies in Africa right now. Look at what happened in Tanzania. And so it, it's not going to end here. Some people rose up to agitate for the independence of Nigeria from the colonial masters. And the agitations are on now. Whether people are being killed or not, will you kill 200 million Nigerians? The answer is no. And so when you have the opportunity to manage resources, you either excel or you fail. And okay. from all indications, this regime appears to be failing. But there is always an opportunity to make a U-turn. And go back to the Constitution. The primary purpose of government is the security and the welfare of the people. Okay. You made three, promises, three major promises in 2015 to fight corruption, to fix the economy, and of course, to, 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 to fight the insecurity that is in the country. But what report do we have in the boardroom now? We have gone worse in all these major areas. Mm. And so it's either you hide your head in shame or wait for God to bring about the change that the people decide because God means okay. well for the people. All That's right. why the likes of us have decided not to keep quiet. And we agree with the fact that somewhere along the line, the sun will rise and there will be light at the end of the tunnel. All right. And that is what Nigeria deserves. Can you imagine, and let me end with this, that Nigeria that has the largest deposit of proven gas in Africa is now threatening the people that the price of gas may be increased by 100%. We don't have electricity. We are constructing railway line to Nigeria Republic. We are planning to set up uh, filling stations in Nigeria Republic. So what, what offense have Nigerians committed that has made them to be so, you know, subjected to this level of, of hardship? But then... We may be helpless, we are not hopeless. Okay. We keep praying and right. talking that there shall be an intervention to put this country back on the path of prosperity. Okay. That's what we deserve. I want to thank you very much. Bolaba is a political analyst and Gideo Logun is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part thank of this very conversation. Much for the opportunity. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. And when we return, as 2023 approaches, we will be discussing youth and, of course, if they are adequately prepared for political leadership. Stay with us.